Hey guys, Connor Laid here. Happy Hispanic Heritage Month. We are very lucky today to be joined by sporting director of the New York Red Bulls, Dennis Hamlet, to talk about Hispanic heritage and his journey to where he is today. Dennis, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here with us today. Uh, how you doing? I'm doing well, Connor. Thank you for having me here and uh, looking forward to our chat. Dennis, I want to kick things off, uh, kind of rewind, uh, take it back to the beginning a little bit. Um, talk about being born and growing up in Costa Rica. Uh, what was it like growing up in such a beautiful country with uh, a, a rich heritage and passion for, for soccer or football? Yeah, you know, I think you hit it. Uh, I, I was born and raised in Costa Rica till the age of 10. Um, and I tell a little story of, of growing up in Costa Rica regarding football. And so, you know, um, I was a member of my brothers and I would have to go to church on, on a Sunday morning uh, and my dad would always be waiting outside the, the church for us uh, so we can rush out and, and, and get to the to the to the stadium for the kickoff at, at 1130. And so uh, and as a little little boy, you know, you remember those those days and, and, and just going to the stadium and seeing your team play and seeing the players and you just. You know, that was my love you know, so i fell in love with the game and and um, just always said you know i want to be i want to be one of those guys one day you know and so that's something that stayed with me and and obviously when i moved here to the us uh to maryland uh i did what every other kid nowadays is doing you know you um, you know you train during the week and you you go play games all over the place on the weekends um and it's, it's just a love of the game stayed with me from from those days and, and came here and i just kept playing the game, kept playing the game. And, um, and you know, fortunate enough, I, I was good at what I did and, and I was able to get a scholarship and, and, and sort of put the next step and, and went and played collegiate, collegiate soccer. Uh, and I was lucky enough to to play at George Mason University and uh, who was coached at the time by Gordon Bradley. Uh, I'm sure you know, he's, he's passed away now, but a lot of people, uh, he was a famous uh, coach doing an NASL and was able to coach Pele and Beckenbauer. So, uh, you know, that was my, that was my coach in college. So just imagine the stories he had about those players. And so, uh, you know, I was just fortunate. You know, I, th I think uh, when I look back at my career in, in, in soccer, it's just the people I've been able to meet and, and their ability to sort of help me get to the next step. It, it's I just owe it to them. Uh, you know, go back to think of how my dad would always take me to watch the games and that's how I fell in love with the game and, and coming here and playing in the States and having Gordon Bradley, who, who you know who taught me a lot in college. And then he gave me the opportunity to to try professionally after I graduated from college in Fort Lauderdale with Thomas Rangan, uh, who coached in the MLS. And you know, so he gave me that opportunity. And, and because I went there, I, you know, that sort of kickstarted my professional career. Uh, <clears throat> and, you know, that was back then 90, 90, 92 93 94 I'm dating myself here uh but you know that was a back then there was no professional soccer it was you know it was a six month uh league that you played and uh but man it was very competitive and and you know sort of the old school you know nowadays i i, I look at some of these players i'm like man you guys been not, you wouldn't make it back then <laughs> it was so hard and more physical but you know you learn a lot during those times and uh and again that that step led to the MLS and, and uh, they would play one year in, in the MLS and uh, and that was the first year of the league and, and, and to think now 25 years later how the league has grown is is amazing because it's I do remember when it when it first started and, and what it was like and now to think that we have 20 24 teams maybe next year 26 teams is is something you couldn't believe yeah it's incredible how it's grown um, talk a little bit about you coming to the United States, you know, when you were mentioned you were 10 years old, uh, what was that transition like for you? Was it difficult, you know, adjusting to a new country, a new way of life? And what kind of things did you bring kind of from Costa Rica that made it more comfortable? You know, it, it, it was difficult at first because, you know, uh, first of all, the language was was the, the biggest barrier because growing up in, in, in Costa Rica, it's you know you go to school and it's all Spanish and, and so but thankfully uh, you know my dad and my grandmother back in Costa Rica we you know we had to go take English classes just to learn the basics but you know again you went to those classes you don't really want to learn because you want to be outside playing with your, with your buddies in in, uh, in the yard and so we had a little bit of, of language a uh, little bit of classes that we took and, and help in the process but coming here it was like. Uh, 
I mean, Costa Rica is a small country, probably the size of uh, Indiana. And so now you come to America and it's just like, you know, first time on a plane, uh, you know, you're coming here, the weather, and it's just so many things that are so different. Uh, but at the same time, exciting and a new experience, uh, new language, uh, new culture, how people do things. Uh, and so big city, you know, uh, it's just as a, as a 10 year old, you're looking at these things and, and you're not used to, to, to seeing all the things that are just flying around you and you're like wow this is like this is amazing you know you, you're excited about it but at the same time a little bit scared because you're not sure how do you fit in how do you handle yourself but you know i i, I was lucky enough that uh, in my neighborhood you know you know you end up playing games you start playing soccer and obviously they could see that i could play soccer so it's kind of like all right well make sure we get this guy on your team because you know he can help us out you know and back then soccer wasn't as big but you know i think that was sort of my introduction to i guess adjusting to life in america is through sports and you know, i think that was a connection and like with anything you start playing a sport and that's sort of the common language everyone sort of understands that be soccer basketball football baseball and so thankfully i was able to do the the soccer part and, and made the connections there and, and that sort of stayed with me and and in some ways it 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 kept me grounded and, and kept me sort of focused you know doing the school but at the same time Hey, soccer was my thing, and and so those, that's the life I lived: school and soccer, school and soccer, and and, and that uh, you know it helped in the process of becoming disciplined and, and making sure you, I, I push for what I wanted, which just to keep trying to go as far as I can when it when it came to soccer. I'm laughing to myself because I'm remembering uh, you talking about church and going to games. I remember plenty of times having green guards out in the middle of uh, church and. Yeah, always ready. Always yeah. ready. Had to be ready. <laughs> had to be ready. And you had to go to church because you know, mom and grandma were like, "No, no, no, yeah. you can't just skip out on Sunday." That's one thing you had to do. So uh, priority. Yeah. <laughs> Love it, um, Dennis. As a player, uh, you took us through your uh, career. But as a player, uh, coach, and now a sporting director, um, how much was your approach to the game influenced by your Costa Rican heritage and the Pura Vida lifestyle? <laughs> You know, a lot because I think it, it's the for me it's the passion, the love that that you know when I was a five, six, seven year old that that was introduced, and I think and and now when you think about it, if, with anything you do in life, you, you got to have that passion, you have to have love, that drive that 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 stays with you, and so having that at an early age, understanding what that meant, it, it meant something, and so now then you're going to want to work harder for that, and so when I think about my life through my career as a, as a player, it's just that drove me to, to be the best I possibly could be, you know, just because I love and the passion to, to try and be the best. And so, and now when, when I got into coaching, it was sort of the same thing. It's like, you know, you got to appreciate the game for what the game is and make sure you, you, you don't cheat the game, you know? And, and I think that's something that, you know, I always remember, you know, play, play this game if it was your last game, you know, and, and enjoy it because uh, that's the beauty of it. You know, you don't want to come out there and, and not take it seriously. And so, as a coach, I tried to make sure that, you know, those are those are some of the values that, that I try to put down on my team. And, you know, I learned that uh, in my days with Chicago, my early days uh, learning to be a coach. You know, I, I started coaching when I was 27. So, which is, you know, nowadays it seems to be the norm. But back then it was not the norm. You know, most, most coaches aren't starting out that, that, that early. But for me, I chose at that moment to do that. And, uh, and so I was able to learn, you know, one of my mentors is Bob Bradley. Uh, and just, you know, just understanding the game and what the game meant and, and make sure that you appreciated it for what it is. And so I did that as as, 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 as a coach. And then I think it, when you come down a role as a sporting director, just trying to find players who have that, that love, that passion for the game to make sure now that uh, they appreciate it. Uh, and, you know, when they step on the field, they, you can see they enjoy it because at the end of the day, it, it's, it's, it, it's a game. It's still a game and, and you want to make sure that when you step on the field, you give it all, give it your all. And then when you come off and all well, you can say, listen, I gave it my best and then get ready for tomorrow. How do you feel about being one of the Latino sporting directors in our league? Um, and what responsibility do you feel that entails? You know, listen, I'm proud. I'm proud of it because I, I think uh, I paid my dues. You know, uh, it took me 12 years to, to as an assistant to get my first head coaching job. Um, and then, but it's through the process is believing in yourself, uh, continue to, to, uh, have a growth mindset to, to learn, uh, to grow, to be a good person. You know, I think, uh, 
it's important to to treat people the right way how you will, how you would want to be treated and so i think all, all all my experiences throughout my career set me up for this opportunity to become a sporting director and it's not by coincidence i think it's from all the hard work that was done and, and so you know uh, i think with, with what i would say to anyone that's out there you got to make sure now that you know you continue to do your work believe in yourself and if you do i, I think good things will come come from it I want to touch on the Latino influence in sports here in the U.S. For example, you know, you notice in baseball, uh, we have the Latino presence growing exponentially really every year and they're dominating in the MLB. But now in MLS, the growth is very noticeable, uh, especially with younger Latin American players arriving in the league. Uh, what can you attribute to the rapid success uh, of these Hispanic players and why is MLS a, a league perfect for them to come, adapt and ultimately thrive? You know, I think it's when I look back and I think it's about the opportunity. And in, in some ways, as I look back and, and when my my mom and my family came here it, to America, it's about the opportunity. Right. And so now I see a lot of Hispanics uh, from Central America, South America, and you, even Europe, that they see MLS as an amazing opportunity. Uh, it's like, you know, who doesn't want to live in America? Right. You know, and so now you, you're able to come to a an, an amazing country uh, that has a grown league and, and to be able to play. Um, and they, 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 you know, the players are starting to see that the, the, the quality of the football is good, uh, the stadiums, everything that comes with it. And so uh, I think it's just, it's a culmination of all the, 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 the good qualities that are happening in this country that makes it, it makes it an, excite, an exciting part for the players to take their next step in their careers to come, come to America. And so, it, it, for me, there's no surprise uh, that you'll con you'll continue to see the the number of Hispanics grow in our league. Uh, and again, you, you know, and and there's also a comfort level for a lot of Hispanics because they know that pretty much anywhere you go in the U.S., you have the ability to speak Spanish, and and there's a sense of you're not a, you're not at home, but you're not you can still feel at home because you get certain things that you have here. And I think that's that's a comfort for a lot of players, you know. Um, and you know, when you think about why some players don't do well when they go to Europe. It's it's just the adaptation of the language, the co culture, uh, you know, the weather. Uh, and so I think here in the U.S., you feel, at least it gives the players uh, enough that they feel there's a comfort in, in, and realistically, it's an easy, easier to get to South America than it is to fly to Europe, you know what I mean? And so you can get there in, in, in one day. So I think a lot of those things just add up and, and uh, makes it makes it a good destination for players. Dennis, you've said that the best player you've seen compete in football tennis or head tennis, as it may be called, is Mexican legend Cuauhtémoc Blanco. Uh, can you talk about coaching him and uh, what his impact was not only in Chicago, but on the world stage? He was such an amazing player. Honestly, he, uh, he all he wanted to do was just play, literally. Like he didn't care about tactics or any of those things. He just wanted to get on the field and get his guys and let's just go uh that, that that was the beauty the guy he was such a winner you know uh and he demanded so much from his players and so for me it was just like i would just say guys listen blanco's like a butterfly he's just going to wander all around the field and you just got to make sure that if he goes to the right you just make sure you go to the left and make sure we have balance that's it you know because he will find you his ability uh i've never seen anybody in our league that with the ball his feet right or left foot and he would just, he will find it and he will put it right there. And uh, amazing. And, uh, you know, you mentioned the story about head tennis, but my Lord, he, uh, you know, during preseason, we would always have these days where we, we were like, okay, you know, we're working the guards, working the guys really hard. So let's just have an easy day. Let's have a soccer tennis tournament. I'm sure you, you played in many of those, right? And so, yep. but with him, it, w it was so competitive and he, he just didn't want to lose. And it was like, he just went at it. And if, when you look at him, he's, he's not the, uh, you know, he's like not the most athletic, strong, physical guy, right? And so, but when he's playing soccer tennis, he's just like the, this sort of transformation comes out and he just gets there and he's just heading the ball, like literally. And to the point, like they ended up winning and the next day he comes in and, and it's just like, he's got the heating pad around his neck. It's like, he can't turn because he's like, <laughs> My neck is sore from snapping the ball so many times, but uh, what a great guy! I mean, and uh, and the following, you know, 
back back then it was like he's probably the biggest Mexican player that came in our league at that time and he has such a following and you know uh, we would travel and, and literally it's like every place we went it was like one of the biggest crowds that those stadiums would have because everyone came to see Cuauhtémoc Blanco and man he put a show on yeah he, he he knew that was happening and he wanted to make sure that he left those fans going home uh, you know he, he, he played his part and so we had an amazing two years run with him in Chicago and um, man what what a player he, he was and I, I, I'll tell this one story about Cuauhtémoc uh, this is how I didn't realize like I knew he was big big time but you know we went to preseason uh, in Mexico so we pull up and we just had one game to play here right because it's part of this whole you know with Blanco you sort of had these tours you go and play games so we were going to go play Mexicali we showed up and it was in a baseball stadium and we walked out we went on the field and like I don't think anyone had played in this baseball stadium for like maybe two years I mean there are bare bottles broken on the field and like and I'm like, we can't play here. There's, there's no way, you know? And so literally we just found like a little, maybe like a 10 by 10, 20 by 20 area just to do a little warm up and figure it out. And so we're going back on the bus. Uh, and the one guy comes over and he's like, hey, Coltemo, can I have your your signature? So he goes out and he signs Coltemo Blanco on his forearm, like literally. Like, I'm like, all right, you know, and we go back to the hotel and we come back the next day. They kind of cleared the field a little bit more. And the guy shows up and he's got this big pickup white truck with Club America emblem logo on the car. And he comes out and, uh, and he's like at the window, like, hey, can you get Cuauhtémoc, Cuauhtémoc Blanco? I'm like, so I say, hey, Temo. So he comes out. I think Temo comes out the bus, goes and sees the guy. And literally he had tattooed the signature on his hand. I'm not kidding you. And I was just like. That's when I realized, like, wow, this guy's like a hero down there. And it was yeah. just, just amazing. But great guy. Um, you know, and, and it's funny, he ended up uh, leaving us and went back to Mexico, played some, and then ran for mayor or governor in Mexico. So, uh, but amazing guy. I enjoyed my two years with him. Yeah, what a player. Uh, really, world icon, really. Yeah. Um, are there any other uh, Hispanic players or coaches that you've played with or? worked with uh in your career that stick out to you as you know some of the big time uh ones that affected you or kind of made you into the person you are today yeah i mean um it's it's, i would say stoichkov but he's not hispanic but he spent many years in barcelona and and and, you know he's sort of known as a big big idol in barcelona and uh i had the pleasure you know coaching him in chicago same thing and uh and what stuck stuck out again? You talk about the competitor that he was. Uh, just wanted to win, you know, at anything. Uh, and so it just it's it's the the common thing that you you have that I found with people have come across it, that it's the love for the game, the passion that they bring. Uh, when you put those two together, uh, anything can happen, you know. Uh, you know, when I look and see some of the Hispanic guys that sort of come through and play in our league, you know, one guy I've always, I never had a chance to coach him, but this is back in my, uh, Lionel Alvarez, who played for Dallas Burn. Same thing, how he carried himself uh, on the field and the competitor he was. Uh, you know, Valderrama the same thing, you know. Now again, a lot of people might not know some of these guys because they played in early years in the league, but I think they, they were sort of the, the icons of our league, uh, sort of sort of kickstart our league. and. And what they had was, man, they were talented. Uh, they had a love for the game. And when they stepped on the field, you know, they, they brought it. They were showmen. Uh, so I think uh, MLS was blessed with, with having, in the early years, those types of players to sort of help kickstart the league and, and, and put it on the map. And, and, and now you're starting to see more younger and younger uh, players coming through from South America, Central America, now that have had major impacts in our league. Lastly, uh, I want to quickly talk about... Uh... As the upcoming World Cup in 2026 approaches, um, how much do you think our soccer landscape uh, is changing, especially in the United States uh, with the bid of United States, Mexico, and Canada? You know, you've been here uh, from the beginning of the league in 96 and mm-hmm. before that. Um, so how have you seen that grow and what do you think that the World Cup being here is going to do to even make that grow even more? Listen, I, I, I think it's it's going to be amazing. You know, I, I look back in, uh, in, in 94, uh, what that was like, you know, when you think about 
it was the first time FIFA ever gave uh, a country a World Cup without having a, a real professional league at the time. And so, and and I just remember how the, the buzz uh, around the whole country during that time. And I was lucky enough to be able to, I was playing for Anaheim Splash Indoor and we had tickets to go to the, the World Cup final in the Rose Bowl. So I actually made it to one World, one, one World Cup final. And uh it was amazing just to see the people and the energy and, and what it brought. You know, when you talk about soccer as the sort of number one sport played around the world. And we weren't sure how that was going to be like here in, in the U.S. at that time because we didn't really have anything to measure ourselves because there was no soccer. And then I think after that, it was like, wow, it's like soccer is here to stay, you know. And I think now that with, with the formation of our league and, and seeing the growth and seeing how now we're starting to see younger players uh, that are coming through our academies, uh, are becoming stars and are able to play n- not only here, but across uh, in the bigger leagues in Europe. I, I think 2026 is, is going to be, if, 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 if in, in 94, if it was sort of like a, an awakening or a, a, a coming out moment, I, I think it's going to be like, I mean, we're, we're going to put the world on, 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 on notice because you're going to see truly a, uh, a field, you know, the U.S. is going to really be representative of, of you know, have Mexican Americans, Americans, Spanish American. I mean, you're going to have a just a, a a balance of players growing up in this country, uh, and I think it's going to be well represented come come 2026. And I think that that will be a proud moment because soccer is the world's game, and you now you're going to see truly see people from all over the world representing the U.S. and and I think that that will be a, a special moment, and even to the fact that. You know, it's going to be represented with the U.S., Canada, Mexico. Again, it sort of ties all the Americas together. So I think it's, it's it'll be a big statement. Uh, and, and I'm excited because I think there's going to be enough quality players that actually started here in, in this country and grew up to love the game and, and, and reach and to be able to play at the high level. It's, it's it'll be a proud moment for football in this country. Dennis, thank you so much for sharing your stories, mm. uh, your journey with us. Um, thank you for celebrating your heritage and uh, and Hispanic heritage as a whole with us. Um, you're inspiring young Hispanic players, coaches, sporting directors with all the hard work that you're doing. And we really appreciate your time. Best of luck with the rest of the season. We know uh, you guys are going to do very, very well. Uh, thanks, God. Appreciate it. And, uh, you know, listen, it's, it's, it's all about the hard work and believing in yourself and, and, and finding your... Uh, your passion for it you know i think that's and you, you know you do that and then anything can happen and so I'm, I'm living proof of that so uh appreciate it man awesome thanks dennis hi guys